that you have to do to have a successful journey. So yeah, pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, next, we have Chad Rubin. Chad, why don't you give us an intro to yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Chad Rubin here. Excited to be here, and thanks for having us, Safe. Uh, I run a company called Prophecy. We dynamically change price, just like Uber, for private label brands to maximize profit on the channel. Uh, I've been in the space for 20 years. Today, I'll be talking about really using price and using a whole lot of other levers, both advertising and finding the right people and process my business to turn around my e-com business. So I have a fairly large e-commerce business. I work to turn it around, and I'm going to be sharing a lot of those hacks or nuggets later today. Sounds awesome. Uh, so for number four, we have, I hope I'm pronouncing this one right again. Is that Kagan? Yeah, uh, this is Kagan. Thank okay, you very much for having us here. And I'm the co-founder of Profit Cyclops. Uh, I'm an eight-figure seller veteran. Uh, we are working more than 4,000 sellers, buyers. Uh, when I say buyers, you know, Amazon business buyers and lenders. What we do is we do profit analytics for store owners. We are working with eight, nine-figure sellers. And we are showing, you know, the items that are profitable. And we are showing the, you know, fees and items that are eating the profits. Uh, and, you know, we are helping the sellers to scale furthermore and cutting the costs. And I'm going to give you today uh, what's going to be like, what should be your profit margins? Uh, we, I have some hard data saying that what should be your profit margin if you're selling, you know, a uh, private label or what should be your profit margin if you're a reseller and how you can improve your profitability. Perfect. That sounds interesting. So for number five, we had we have Rashad uh, Hussein. Why don't you give us an intro about yourself? Thank you, Saif. Um, thanks for the intro. Uh, my name is Rashad. I'm the founder of What Sales, and uh, we are a profitability and performance analytics platform for sellers. We work with uh, a multitude of sellers uh, around the world, and uh, our take on profitability is slightly different. We uh, we focus in on the performance drivers which are driving the profitability. Um, and in today's session, we're going to be doing a very quick walkthrough and highlighting those areas which I feel whether you're a, a two-figure seller or a seven-figure seller, you need to have a grip on them to, to be able to effectively scale your business. Sounds good. So that's it for the speakers we have today. We have five people, including me. For the agenda, I'm going to go up first. I'm going to talk about strategies for managing your catalog to grow past seven figures. Next up, as discussed, is Vincenzo talking about optimizing the Amazon sales funnel. Next up after that is Chad Rubin. Uh, his topic is from red to black, the ultimate turnaround playbook. Number four, we have Kada Kagan Adair. What profit margin should Amazon sellers aim to maintain? And for five, we have Rashad Hussein um, with performance drives profitability as his topic. After that, we're going to have a short Q&A session where you guys can ask any questions you have about any of the topics discussed and one of us will answer your questions. I'm going to go up first. I'll just pop screen share open. And I'll show you the sides that I have prepared for my topic. So if you guys can just give me a moment. Share screen. Desktop and share. Just give me a moment for this to log in. All right, hold on guys. Right, so give me a second. I'll, I think I might have to be joined to share my screen. Hold on, guys. No worries. That's fine. Right, I'm going to assign Vincenzo as host for a moment. Okay, I have the power now. <laughs> I guess in the meantime, while we wait, we can ask people in, 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 the, in the list where, where you guys joining from, where you guys uh, basically watching us from. Uh, you know, what are some of your challenges in 2024? I'm interested to see some of that comments in the chat. Let's see. Oh, that was quick, Saif. I was expect I was actually making some time. <laughs> All right, perfect. We're good to go. Let me just do it. Let's do it then. Okay. Uh, open. All right, and here we go. Can everyone see Let's my screen? Yes, we can. We can. All right, awesome. Let me just open up my slides here. Let me move you guys. To the other side of my screen. I'm just going to reclaim host for a second. And uh, perfect. Let me just hit present. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can. We can. 
Right. Awesome. So my topic is managing your catalog to grow past seven figures. So what does managing your catalog actually mean? Managing your catalog means adding and removing products according to performance, plus distributing budget and effort across your existing catalog to drive new revenue or profitability. You know, give me a second. Let me just. OK, so why does it matter? So you need two things essentially to scale from early seven figures to late seven figures or even early eight figures. You need new ASINs to get you there because the ASINs that got you to a million dollars a year in revenue probably aren't going to scale 10 extra from here to get you to $10 million a year in revenue. The second thing is once you become a scale up brand and you have a significant catalog, a lot of the ASINs that you have in your catalog will perform very differently. Some of them will do very well. Some of them will be complete duds and some of them will be in the middle. So you need to learn what to invest more in and what to cut quickly. Else you're going to spread yourself too thin and not see any growth. And essentially, once you get to that point, the only two ways to grow is to grow the ASINs that are already doing well and squeeze more revenue out of them or to keep launching new ASINs every single month, every single quarter to have more shots on goal, essentially, and potentially hit a few new hero ASINs and have those increase your revenue. So step number one is finding ASINs to bet on. So these are the ASINs we're gonna, where we're going to be improving the listing content and the ads for. And for these ASINs, I tend to have four criteria to try and find them. Number one is a play on the 80-20 uh, rule. And that's that I want the ASINs that I'm going to focus on to be contributing 80% of revenue. So if I line up the ASINs uh, from best selling to worst selling, like I want my ASIN to be at the cutoff of the products that are producing 80% of my revenue, if that makes sense. For number two, I wanted to have an average or below average tackles compared to my other advertised ASINs. And that means that it's performing well with the ads and it still has room to scale. Because if I have something that's already at the super high tackles, if I try to push it even harder, you could give up a lot of profitability or just face a lot of resistance because you might already be super competitive with your ads and there's just not that margin, that much margin to improve. Number three is it has to have a solid net margin. Once you scale, your net margin usually goes down just because advertising costs get more expensive and expanding your market share also gets more expensive. So once you scale, you can expect the net margin to go down. So if it's already low to begin with, you can end up being at break even or even losing money. Or you could have such a small margin that the increase in sales does nothing to your bottom line. So that's also something you want to keep an eye out for. And then number four, I usually try to find ASINs where I have competitors that are selling significantly more product than me. Because that means that I still have room to grow. If I'm already number one in the market, I have a 30% market share and I'm doing super well, then I'm not going to be able to 2x from here. I won't make it to a 60% market share, right? The only chance that I 2x is if the entire market 2x is from that point. But you can't be number one in the market and 2x within a reasonable time frame. What do you do to make these ASINs actually grow? Number one is make listing adjustments. And with listing adjustments, you can either improve price, reviews, or listing content. Or number two, you can improve the PPC, which essentially is reallocating the budget within the account to improve your ROI or just increasing your budget to get more clicks and sales. Right? So for the actual listings, price and reviews obviously are a massive factor. I'm not going to discuss them today. I think Chad is going to discuss price. He probably knows a lot more about price than I do. And then for reviews, like you just want to do as much as possible to get as many reviews as you can. So if you have an off Amazon audience, leverage that. If you can roll into Vine, leverage that. But it's not going to be the focus of my presentation. For the presentation, I'm mostly going to talk about listing content because listing content is also a huge factor, especially if you haven't given it the proper attention when you're below seven figures, either because of time or budget constraints. Right now is the right time to fix it because if you go in, and you improve your A-plus content, you maybe add premium A-plus content, make better bullet points, better titles, better listing images, like that can increase your conversion rate significantly. And once the conversion rate goes up, you obviously make more revenue because more of your traffic converts into actual customers. Your organic goes up and your A-cost goes down because you need fewer clicks to make each sale now. So what I'd suggest is if you're at seven figures or higher or even half a million or higher, to be honest, identify those ASINs using the previous criteria that I gave you and go out and find a really good agency or a really good freelancer to come in and create your content for you. Over here, I have three listings or examples from three listings. The top row are just listing images that we have. Then the bottom row are some of the uh, A-plus content images that we made for these brands. 
These are some examples that we produced. These are good examples, you know, each and every one of these brands. Besides the Go Macro one, this was just an example for a YouTube video I put up a couple of days ago. But the two others saw huge revenue gains after we uploaded the new content. So it is something that you want to focus on, especially if you're going to drill down on four or five ASINs. It should be pretty fast to get your content up and entirely affordable. And if you're going to plan on reallocating budget to these ASINs or just like spending more budget on top of what you're already spending on these ASINs, you really need to have good content in place or else you might end up burning too much money. So this is the first thing you should update once you decide on the ASINs that you're going to go after and generally either find a freelancer or an agency to do this. Or if you have to do it in-house and just do a ton of research, figure out the exact points that the customer needs to hear before they buy, figure out how you're going to portray that in the images using as little words as possible. And then just go out, either do the designs yourself if you're good at graphic design, or just get some freelancer for a couple hundred dollars and they should be able to knock them all out for you. Right, so that's the first step. After that, you want to start looking at PPC. So the first step is reallocating budget. So you have seven different ways of reallocating your budget. You can move your budget from lower to higher performing ASINs. So if you identify five good ASINs out of a catalog of 50 ASINs, they don't have the capacity to increase your total monthly ad spend. You could start to move money from these lower performing ASINs to the higher performing ones. Number two, you could move the budget between targeting types. So if you have like product targeting campaigns that aren't doing so well and you have auto campaigns that are doing much better, you can try to shift that budget to the auto campaign. And this works either way. You could do this between auto and manual, keyword than category targeting. You just have to create a spreadsheet, figure out what does well and what doesn't well, doesn't do well for your brand. And based on that, you're just going to move the budget around between those to number one, try to get the most like sales per dollar spent as you can. And then number two, if you can shift it from something like a category targeting campaign to an exact match manual, that could also help with your uh, organic crank. Number three, you can move budget between match types. So generally I've seen people either like over invest in a match type that's not doing so well for them, or they're just like under invested in another match type that's actually doing a lot better than the two others that they have money into. So with situations like this, if they don't have the extra budget, I can redistribute some of the budget from one of the match types to the other match types to try to get them that better ROI that's going to move the needle for them and increase their revenue. Number four, again, is simple. Like you want to move your budget between placements. Most of you probably have most of your spend going to rest of search. And then some subset of you are going to have most of their spend going to top of search. If you have high placement boosts, then a smaller percentage of you will have their spend going to product detail pages. You want to figure out where your spend is going. And if it makes sense, like is that spend going to the highest ROI placement? And obviously you can't force all of your spend into one placement. So you have to be like, literal about the way you do this but if you're like super over indexed on top of search because you have placement boosts on everything and it turns out top of search is running at 50 percent acos whereas like rest of search and product page are running at 25 each like at that point you can increase your base bid and pull back a bit on the top of search placement so you can get more placements on the other two so this is also a big unlock i've done this for several brands and we've seen reasonable like 10 15 20 percent revenue gains uh number five uh, is moving budget between ad types. You might have some ad types that are running that aren't doing so well, uh, or you're just over indexed on some ad types that are doing well. And you have some other ad types, like maybe sponsored brand that are being neglected. And you could start to move budget between like SD and SB, SB and SP, depending on performance and how like maxed out you are on each ad type. And that can also increase the sales that you guys are getting. Number six is reallocating from branded to generic. So with bigger brands, especially those with a presence of Amazon, I usually see them spending 20% plus. I've even seen 70% plus of their budget on branded. And obviously there is no specific number that you're supposed to spend. It depends on your category, how big your brand is. You know, if you're selling a replenishable or a one-time purchase, like these are all things to take into account. But generally people are overspending on branded just because the ACOS looks good, even though you know, it's debatable how much incremental revenue you're driving by doing that. So what you can do is if you don't have the budget to increase monthly ad spend, you can take some of your branded spend and move it into generic to increase your sales there. And also increase your organic rank on generic. Number seven is you can reallocate budget from uh, low to high performing campaigns. 
So if you have some campaigns that aren't doing well, and this sounds logical, and you guys should be doing this anyway, even if you're not going to be implementing this strategy, but a lot of you guys are going to have campaigns that are spending hundreds or thousands every single month, and they're not doing too well. And either you've been too busy to check it, or you have it running for some reason, and it's just not performing for you. Like you can decrease the budget on that or drop the bids on that and move that into another campaign that's doing better for you guys. And you should be doing this obviously at all times, whether or not you're managing your catalog in the same way I'm describing right now. Right? In terms of increasing budget, you also have seven different strategies. These are more straightforward. Number one is just increase bids. If anything's doing well for you, the conversion rate's good. You're starting to rank organically. Uh, you're getting a decent sales volume. Pump the bids for those. That's going to bring in more traffic and increase your sales. Obviously, ACOS and TECOS might go up, but if you did a good job on selecting the right ASINs and you had enough net margin left and you had a good TECOS to begin with, there shouldn't be that much of a concern. Uh, number two is increasing budgets on account portfolio or campaign levels. This is, again, pretty straightforward. Number three is adding new keywords. You can either do keyword research on tools like Helium 10 or Jungle Scout or use things like the Search Query Performance Report or Harvest. This is something that's super important. A lot of people just set up their campaigns once. They never add anything again. They just have the campaigns that they set up like a year ago. You need to keep harvesting like every single week. You need to do keyword research as often as possible. You need to keep adding new things, testing new things, um, you know, experimenting with new things. Or else you're just going to reach a point of stagnation. Like I've had accounts that we've worked with who had products up for multiple years, like four or five plus years. They've been advertising them for as long and you're still able to go in and find new keywords for them. So you probably have a lot of keywords that you haven't utilized yet. And if you're looking to increase your budget, you should go out and look for those, right? And also like, don't look at it as just the keyword because one keyword can be multiple targets. So if you have one keyword in exact broad and freeze, then that's technically three different targets. So if you only have the keyword in exact, like adding it to broad and phrase, could technically count as two new targets. So it's something you should focus on as well. Number four is adding new or expanding existing targeting types. Again, if you're like spending all of your money on auto, which a lot of accounts that I've audited recently have been doing, uh, if you're spending too much of your money on auto and not enough on the manual campaigns, then you can start harvesting from the auto to manual to pump spend on the manual and get more sale and organic rank through that. Uh, if you're not doing any product or category targeting, experiment with that and so on. Uh, number five, we have adding new or expanding existing match types. This is similar to what I said before. The three match types generally spend the same amount. Broad spends the most, phrase spends a little less than that, and exact spends a little less than phrase. Usually, obviously, these numbers can be different for every account. But out of every two or three accounts that I look at, there's usually a big mismatch. Like some people are just over-indexed on exact. Like they just have like 90% of their manual spend going to exact and nothing going to broader phase. And logically, if broad and phase are supposed to spend as much as exact, you're missing out on two thirds of spend and sales. So that's something you should like keep attention. Oh, sorry, pay attention to. Uh, and you should fix, like you should ideally be spending equal amounts on the three match types. Number six, uh, adding new or expanding existing ad types. A lot of people haven't really set up sponsored band campaigns. A lot of people haven't set up sponsored display campaigns, even though I'm not the biggest fan of sponsored display. But generally, you should have 85% of your budget going towards sponsored product. If it's any more than that, it probably means you don't have enough campaigns set up in the other two ad types. So at the very least, if you're not going to run sponsored display, run sponsored brand. And within the sponsored band campaigns, like just go after the same keywords and the same match types for the same ASINs as you did in sponsored product. And that's going to give you a decent spend and revenue boost. Uh, last thing is number seven, launching rank campaigns. The rank campaigns are just going to be exact match manual campaigns where you're going to bid pretty high, probably towards the uh, end of the suggested bid range. You're going to have high placement boosts and that's going to help you rank higher on the main keywords that you're going after within a couple months. So it's also a way to uh, like invest like more budget if you're already maxed out on all the other match types, ad types, targeting types, and keywords. Right. These are some results that we've seen by implementing this stuff. So over here, we had an account that joined us uh, towards the end of 2022. The screenshot shows 2023 only. But in February of 23, they were doing 42,000 in sales. And by July, they were doing 325,000. After that, it kind of cooled off because we didn't have as much inventory. But we were able to get this result, which is, I think, I don't know what the math on this is. 
a 7x result, maybe even an 8x result, I'm not sure. Uh, we were able to get this by implementing the strategies that I discussed earlier. So finding more keywords, reallocating budget from bad ASINs to good ASINs, you know, setting up new ad types, setting up new targeting types. This took us from 42K monthly to 325K monthly. This is another account. Over here, we had the month of February. Um, we did 16,000 in spend, 70,000 almost. It's like 69,500 in sales at a 23% ACOTS. A few months after that, we did $36,000 in spend, $181,000 in sales at a actually lower ACOS, which is 21.1%. 20 and again, the way we did this is we picked out the, the right ASINs. Like, hey, these are high potential ASINs where we are maintaining a good margin, good tackles, we're pretty competitive. You know, the CVR is good, the CTR is good, the ACOS is good. The competitors are doing a lot more than we are, so the market's big. We filtered for all of these things. We shortlisted three or four ASINs. We went in super, super hard on those ASINs. We set up more campaigns, more keywords, more match types, more targeting types, more ad types, more everything pretty much. We more than doubled spend. We like 2.5x, 2.25x spend. And the sales went up equivalently. This account was barely scraping seven figures. So it's doing like 70,000 a month in ad sales and maybe like another 40,000 on top of that from organic. And then in the second screenshot from ad sales alone, they were doing like 181,000 per month, right? And the second point after that is launching new ASINs. But before I talk about that, uh, for the ASINs that you haven't shortlisted in the first step, which is you know growing your existing catalog or going the existing ASINs in your catalog, if there's something you haven't shortlisted, that doesn't necessarily mean that you pull back on it. I'd only pull back on something in two cases. Number one, if it's unprofitable, and it's not like a product launch, if it's a mature product that is unprofitable, like I've had this up for more than five months, it's burning a hole in my pocket, it's not really helping the bottom line. At that point, I just aim to stock out on that. Or even if the amount of the unit theft isn't that high and I'm losing money on each unit sold, I might just discard the inventory. Um, or uh, if it's taking up a large portion of your cash, like you know, maybe it's a high volume ASIN that just has a very low margin, it's taking up a large portion of your spend. You have a bunch of money tied up in inventory. You can try to scale that down so that it doesn't hurt the rest of your business. Other than that, if you just have other reasons that are not unprofitable and are not hindering the performance of the rest of your account, I just keep those running. There's nothing wrong with having a couple of reasons that are only doing a few thousand a month if they are profitable and aren't affecting your cash flow, right? Now that we covered that, um, we... We'll cover the second half, which is launching ASINs every quarter. Um, my best clients, and by best, I mean biggest in terms of revenue and in terms of growth, are always launching new ASINs. We work with a top 1,000 Amazon seller who is doing multiple, multiple eight figures. I think at peak, they did like 80 million a year, and they are launching hundreds of ASINs every year, you know, variations and unique products. They launch, we get like a list from them every week of the products that they launch. They're launching a ton of ASINs and they've been able to get really good coverage through that. And through that coverage, they hit like a home run every once in a while and that ASIN takes off. It kind of moves the needle for the entire account at that point. So what I do is I'd sit down if I was a brand owner, I'd figure out how much or how many ASINs I can afford to launch per quarter. You just want to look at the cash investment for the inventory and sending it into FBA, the ad spend investment, and so on, and you can create like a launch budget, and then just say like, with this launch budget, I'll split it out across four ASINs, I'll launch four unique ASINs every single quarter. And you wanna launch these ASINs, you wanna give them the best possible chance of succeeding. So enroll them into Vine. If you're launching multiple variations, list them separately, enroll each one into Vine, then merge. Once the units are claimed, you might get a few hundred reviews out of doing that, depending on the number of uh, variations you have. Launch with the best listing content, you know, put the keywords in the titles and the backend search terms and then bullet points, have everything set up and put them on a four month timeline. By month four, you want to be profitable or at least breaking even, right? Generally what I see is out of every three launches, one will break even, one will be profitable by, by month four and then one will lose you money, right? For the one that loses money by month four, unless it's like a huge opportunity and you think you're making progress, I just cut that out immediately. For the one at break even, you want to analyze why it's at break even is your conversion rate too weak? And is there something you can do about that? Is the cost per click prohibitive? Like, is it like a $20 product with a $3 cost per click? At that point, you can assume you won't turn profitable anytime soon. 
and you can net that one stock out? Um, or is it just like a dud, right? Like no one wants to buy this thing. It's not moving or the market's too small. So you want to figure out why it's unprofitable. And if there's a valid reason for it being unprofitable, you could keep going. Otherwise, I just cut those out and I take the profitable ASIN and I just focus on scaling that. I just try to repeat this cycle as many times per year. And the more ASINs you launch, the more home runs you're going to hit. And the more home runs you're going to hit, the bigger your revenue will be and the more profit you're going to make over the long run. So this is the secret sauce. Like managing your catalog can do very well for you. I just showed you a couple of accounts where we tripled and quadrupled revenue. But at the end of the day, what got you to a million won't get you to 10 million. So if you want to grow sustainably and grow exponentially over the long run, you want to allocate a significant percentage of your you know, cash and your profit towards launching new ASINs every single quarter. And that guarantees um, growth over the long run. Right. So in summary, uh, number one, you need to find your best ASINs, invest in listing content for them, invest in ads to grow them. Number two, you need to commit to a certain number of launches each quarter. Number three, you need to trim the fat ruthlessly, which means your existing catalog, if there's anything that's not doing well, cut it out. And for the launches, anything that's not doing well, cut it out. And you're always like one launch away from hitting your home run. That's pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, I just want to finish with an offer. Uh, we actually provide all of the services I have mentioned in this presentation. So product research, uh, listing content, ads, you know, we do catalog, we do PPC software, we have everything under one roof. And we are offering one month of free managed service for any seller doing above $10,000 a month in ad spend who's based in the US, Canada, or Europe. So if you're one of these sellers and you want to get one month of free management from my team, you can do anything in that one month. Like you can get your listing content done. You can get your PPC fixed. You can get your catalog work done. Claim this month, just book a call with us or just email me at safe at AIHello.com or just go to my website, book a call and mention this webinar and you can get a free month with us. And there's no commitment. If you don't like it at the end of the month, you can decide to discontinue. And if you do like it, obviously you can sign up to our services at that point. That's it for my presentation. I hope this was useful. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening again. Next up, we have uh, Vincenzo. Yeah, thank you, Saif. Uh, amazing presentation. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. So let me share my screen. Um, so... I think you guys should be able to see my screen now. Is that correct? Yep. Awesome. Great. So essentially, uh, what I'm going to be talking today, guys, is how you can optimize your Amazon sales funnel. We always talk about, of course, you know, how we need to optimize our PPC, how we need to optimize our listings and all that. But at the same time, it's important to understand at which in which part within that journey we need to tap in and really put our efforts, right? Because if we understand how a funnel works, like if we go from the awareness all the way to the bottom in terms of conversion, is key that we, uh, we understand like where a realistically specific investment from our side in terms of resources and time is going to give us the best ROAS into basically our money, right? So... Let's dive in quickly. I'm going to jump this intro myself. And essentially, I'm going to talk about what are some of the key elements we usually try to focus on when it comes to optimizing a funnel, right? Because at the end of the day, if we don't optimize the key elements, the first are going to be the ones that cost consumers are going to see when they land on our page. And essentially, they are going to make a decision if buying our product or not. Then essentially, it's going to be a waste of, of traffic, which we're going to be driving from PPC or external traffic, which I'm going to be touching on in terms of how it can be part of that funnel and increase uh, the awareness across the board. So one of the things, of course, we try to focus a lot, a lot when it comes to this is doing a lot of A-B testing, right? Some of the things that uh, I see people underutilizing is specifically tools within Amazon. Like within Amazon, we have the experimental tool, right? You can test multiple elements. And with that, you can figure out what is essentially driving uh, the best uh, improvement within your compression, right? Some of the things we test all the time is images. So for example, the main image, every month we try to come up with different variations. And these variations is very important when you do A-B testing, guys, uh, to improve the, the overall funnel. You do it uh, by analyzing the audience within Amazon, right? So there are many solutions out there, like Big Food, Pro Opinion, Intellivision, some of the top guys out there when it comes to that. And I invite you guys to test them out because at the end of the day, if you make a decision in terms of elements, such as your copy, your images, and your A-plus content, which are the ones we see driving the most 
conversion, then we're also going to uh, touch on price. Uh, essentially, you're working uh, blind, right? You're just guessing. So something we try to do is understand what is people saying in terms of, you know, within the reviews, what are people complaining about product or people loving about products. We also analyze our competition. We come up with a couple of things that we understand really can potentially drive a significant lift within the overall funnel and we test them. So another thing I think is super important on top of that um, it's not only testing, um, you know, your, your image and, and your copy. I think it's also very important to do split testing with uh, pricing. And we have so many experts here that specialize on that and profitability. Pricing has been a super uh, uh, driver when it comes to us improving compression. Because at the end of the day, sometimes I go into calls um, with brands and, and they come up with pricing that don't really reflect the economics of the specific niche. So it's super important that you do this from the very beginning. You understand what is the average baseline price in terms of what is really driving the decision making of a person to really compare your product against your competitor and make the purchase. And I invite you to do that kind of a split testing with pricing. If you combine that with a very nice creative and also at the same time, very nice uh, copy, we, we, you can significantly have a, a big impact into your sales. In fact, I'm going to show you how we do that a very a quick example using Brand Analytics. So Brand Analytics, guys, is my best friend. Like I use it every single day. Brand Analytics is the perfect companion when it comes to understanding your sales funnel because it tells you everything. It tells your impressions. It tells your clicks, add to cards. It tells your purchases, right? So if you're very smart in terms of identifying when you're dropping the ball, that's where you can tap in and basically make changes uh, within your uh, listing, right? So here, for example, very quick example, we identify a, a specific keyword, basically dropping the ball in terms of our CTR was much lower and our conversion rate compared to our competition. So we went in, we did all the changes I, I briefly mentioned. We scrapped all the reviews, all the questions and answers. We come up with all the things in terms of what people are basically talking about when it comes to this avatar. And we come up with new images. We split tested that with a, the Amazon experimental tool. We choose the winner. And then after doing those changes within the image and the title, this was the main change on this specific listing. We're basically able to, to have an increase of, of 3%. Now, be mindful that when we did this uh, change, of course, we only focus uh, on a specific keyword, right? And why do I mention this? Because we've been seeing the space, how the semantic conversation is becoming every single time a bigger thing, right? We are, we are seeing how Amazon is shifting more toward you know, why is actually people uh, trying to um, solve when they're buying a product, right? And actually focusing on the actual search term itself. So what we're trying to do is take into consider consideration the semantics as well. And we also put that into our images and copy to make sure that through that, we convey the actual utility of the product. And we try to attack those specific keywords where we drop in the ball in terms of conversion so we can increase uh, overall performance. And if you do that across multiple keywords and you're able to attack all of that at the same time, that's where you're going to have a significant lift uh, across the board. Now, let's assume you do all this optimization, you focus on really optimizing your images, you focus your um, your copy, your pricing and everything. Then once you do that, of course, what you really want to focus on is how you can then uh, keep improving your uh, organic uh, exposure, right? So that's where uh, external traffic comes into the picture. Of course, PPC is always going to be part of the formula. However, I wanted to bring a little bit of external traffic because I feel that's something that most people is lacking from uh, the perspective of, a uh, you know, how I keep a, uh, you know, uh, on top of my competition. Because when I go and, and usually do audits, the only silver bullet most Amazon sellers have is PPC. They don't really understand about how they can leverage a very targeted audience outside of Amazon, and they can convert that to a very optimized, in this case, funnel, as I briefly exp explained, and then improve your overall conversion across the world. So. Before we start talking about um, essentially uh, the benefits of external traffic, we need to understand what is the main uh, focus in terms of where this traffic is coming from. So this is, is this is a source and this is specifically for Amazon USA, okay? So in, in the USA, essentially, we, uh, once we understand where is all the traffic sources that go to Amazon, of course, you can see direct search, which is within the platform. Uh, that go to a specific link, then you have search, and then you have the other ones that basically relate to external traffic, which is referral, social, mail, and display. So if we're going to do certain strategy within the social, 
side of the how we're going to drive traffic to, to Amazon. We need to understand overall Amazon, which one is the one that's actually driving the most traffic to, to, to a marketplace in the first place. And we can see how YouTube is actually one of the biggest drivers of external traffic. So why I wanted to show you this graph? Because I have this um, conversation all the time. People ask me, let's say I'm designing my, my cell phone by really lacking knowledge in terms of where I should put my efforts because there's so many things. You can do Google Ads, you can do a PR releases, you can do YouTube, you can do Instagram, TikTok. I mean, so many shiny objects. And something that's been very useful for us when we do external traffic is being YouTube. The reason YouTube is very uh, good for us is at the, at the end of the day, it, it goes back to the conversation I, I briefly had on the first uh, section, which is semantics, right? Like people in YouTube, try to find for something a specific a scenario. I'm having this issue, I go to YouTube, I look for a tutorial, I look for somebody having the same issue, and based on that behavior that it described in that video, and they recommend me that product, that's how I go to Amazon make a purchase, right? And by understanding that, not only you can understand your avatar better, but on top of that, you're actually targeting an audience that they're really connecting in the fundamental um, issue they're having um, in, in, in a more warm, way like these are people that really need to solve their issues straight away that's why they're going to youtube and actually spending a few minutes to watch a video so what we're doing is we we partner with influencers let's say for example we have a supplement brands right we try to partner with super uh, big influencers that do videos about these are the top influencers for your keto diet right and they go about oh i'm having this issue with my stomach i'm feeling like this if you're feeling tired Usually this is because of that, and this product can actually solve you that and here and there. And with that kind of actual influ influencer um, marketing, we're seeing very good conversions because it's a bit different than the, the typical interrupted pattern we are seeing in Instagram, Facebook, um, and TikTok that is more straight to the cell. It's more educational videos, and then that's the pitch in between. And then, of course, what we try to leverage here we combine that with the attribution links. We can track all the all the traffic and we even get the, the brand referral points, right? So now, how are we seeing this affecting? So the first of all, of course, this is giving us a, a huge boost in ranking because if you're very clever in terms of how you drive this traffic to Amazon, uh, not only is going to, of course, allow you to convert this and improve your, your uh, bottom line revenue, but on top of that, have a, a, a snowball effect across all your keywords. So now, Something you need to be very mindful though, is that when you do this, you need to be very careful how you filter this traffic. Because some of the mistakes uh, have been seen uh, is um, of course people do this strategy, they partner with certain um, influencers and then they drive a ton of traffic that's not really clean to the listings. And actually if you do that, even if you have the perfect listing, the perfect optimization as I described and how to do it using a brand analytics briefly, uh, you're actually going to still drop the ball because you're going to basically ruin the history of your listing. That's going to ruin everything in terms of, you know, um, the conversion, impression, clicks, and all of that. And when you drop the baseline about how your listing compares against the main competitors in your category, that's going to basically uh, make your listing slip through the ranks, right? So something that we do, very straightforward, uh, whenever we work with all these uh, influencers outside of... Um, Amazon, we are very careful to make sure that we put something in between. So we put like a landing pages, we put like call to actions in these landing pages to filter coupons and things like that. And then that's when we send the traffic um, to, to Amazon. Not only on these landing pages is to actually sometimes give them an extra series of questions to actually convert them, but sometimes it could be even upsells, right? Let's say on the video, the influencers, and we do this all the time, we say, okay, we have this promotion uh, that if you go here, not only you get one pro, but you get a two pro uh, uh, for free. So essentially they will go to Amazon uh, by one, and because they signed to a landing page, they will get a second one ship directly to them, things like that, right? So you need to be very smart, be with this because if you actually then phone on and I'm going to show you how this traffic on a very targeted way, you can actually significantly boost uh, your organic, which is what we want. Not only that they convert with all the work we've been doing in terms of creatives and copies, but they actually allow us to improve organic. So organic, we get organic sales through Amazon that improves the tackles, that is noble effect, and we keep growing the brand from that. So Something that, for example, we try to do is we try to identify keywords that we're actually lacking a brand share and we're lacking ranking. So why that's important? Because if we're going to do a strategy in terms of driving a 
traffic, we want to make sure that we do it in, into keywords that are going to significantly uh, bring an impact to our, our brand, right? So something that we do uh, to induce this, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that this is natural and you're not doing anything that is breaking any 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 rules, is we actually create a script with all these influencers, right? So we create a script about the keywords that they have to keep mentioning about how they can find a product. Sometimes what we do with even uh, some of the pros are already a uh, bottom of page one, mid of, of page one. We create a, a quick video about how the influencer is basically uh, showcasing, you know, go to Amazon and put uh, whatever, vitamin C and, and, and buy this product. And this is the product that's actually fixing this situation that I explained in this video. So you try to uh, basically showcase all this external traffic, how they can go to, to Amazon. This could be done at the keyword level, we don't at the brand level it could be done even directly if you want to um you know if you don't want to focus more on the queue but the actual sales as a whole because even if you do it directly to the pro you're still going to see a significant increase especially if those conversions are very warm by doing the filtering in between so for example in this case we did that and after doing a that essential um basically traffic from outside of Amazon within um, specifically one month, we saw a, a lift of 25 to 89 units, right? And the reason why that happens is because we increase the click share uh, and the brand share on that keyword. That means at the same time that we actually had a higher organic rank on that keyword. I need to also point out on this strategy while we are doing external traffic, we're doing top placement and very aggressive at the PPC level. So this is how you can be very tailored by not only combining the external traffic to basically a uh, feed in, in, you know leads into the funnel but you're actually trying to uh, support that with the advertisement which is more warm leads which is more at the mid at the mid toward the, the lower side of the funnel and essentially all this of course needs to be combined with understanding what is driving the ACO across all your listings right because uh, briefly at the beginning I was mentioning yes you have to optimize your images, which you can use that understanding your audiences, understanding what's really driving the, the behavior be, behind trying to find your product in the first place and make a purchase. But when it comes to ACO, how you actually make sure you have the right keywords? Because at the end of the day, and we actually seen the, a big shift when it comes to these in keywords. I feel Amazon is slowly getting itself uh, focusing heavily on uh, only ACO. We see that all the time. For example, I, I was um, the other day at an event, and one of the speakers was mentioning about this, and I actually have experienced this myself. We have started to see a scenarios where even if you don't have a cure across all your listing, but you have it on your images, right? Or certain behavior across the people buying your product is is buying your product. You started to run to certain keywords, going back to the, to the semantics, right? So that's why you need to be very mindful about how you start adapting your listing to be ready for that. Now, how are we actually trying to basically come across this and, and optimize uh, the listing? So of course, one of the top things that keeps coming back to this is, is brand analytics. So with brand analytics, what we try to always be is on top of what the keywords that Amazon keep feeding to us that are the ones driving the, the most basically uh, search uh, frequency, right? So we try to analyze this uh, in terms of uh, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis. We even prepare this for seasonality. Uh, we even prepare this for product launches. We have multiple clients that sometimes they want to launch a product, let's say for this Q4. So what we do is we use brand analytics to uh, analyze Q4 for 2023, 2022. We understand what are the trends at the keyword level. And we use that to not only prepare our listings in advance, but also understand which are the main drivers of, of traffic uh, within that niche so we can prepare a PPC launch and external traffic launch, right? So understanding this is basically giving you the, the key to the Pandora box of, how you optimize your listing. And then of course you can be very clever also here in terms of which are the competitors that are actually controlling because within this specific screenshot, you can even see that Amazon tells you which are the competitors controlling the, those keywords. And you can be a also strategy in terms of how you attack them with sponsored product campaigns, sponsored display campaigns, and actually try to get as much traffic out of them so you can increase your brand share uh, across the board. Another thing that we use a lot as well, and, uh, and this again has so many new features and it keeps evolving uh, every single time I use it, is a product uh, opportunity explorer tool. So with this one, it's actually uh, even allow you to find uh, search uh, terms, right? So 
not only search terms, but the thing I like the most is point from point two to point four. You you have seen how my whole conversation has been around understanding what is really driving a person to buy your product. And we have seen across multiple cases and multiple webinars and multiple uh, case studies that already been released, how understanding your consumer is going to be more important than ever because the way that behaves your consumer is what is going to define how your product is showcased on Amazon. And if your product details page and images and brand is not tailored toward that, it's going to become irrelevant and therefore you're not going to get position within the right keywords. So if you use the Pro Opportunity Explorer, Amazon is telling you, okay, what is people really saying about this pro, right? Another thing that they just released is a, a purchase drivers. This one itself is gold because now Amazon is telling you what is the main reason people is actually buying this pro in the first place. And if you actually go into this tab and analyze that, it's essentially giving you the, the semantic behind what are the things in into a, a bigger approach that are driving a person to go and essentially choosing your product for a specific issue, right? So then this is basically giving you the answer to be uh, ready for what is coming in terms of, uh, you know, AI within the way people shop on, on Amazon. And then of course, returns. Returns, this one is very important because what we're doing with returns, um, you can usually uh, identify big issues in terms of, you know, things that people complaining about and, and it's basically making your, your listing to not really stand out. You can come with a new version of the listing and you can add it to the current listing or new variation. So this is usually a good way to, you know, stay on top of the game and make sure you drop the ball so, you know, your market share uh, control is basically become smaller because you're not tapping into all these things. So to summarize, I mean, so, some of the things you have to be mindful is to fully optimize your funnel is a combination of things. First thing is the impression you give to people, right? How how people are seeing your product in the first place. So that's where we, we talk about, you know, a, a plus content, your images, your pricing and your copy. You need to make sure you're always split testing that, but split testing with a, 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 a study beforehand, understanding what are actually the elements you're getting from that audience that they are telling you to test. Once you do that, then you want to understand, okay, now that I have fully optimized the top of the funnel, how I send traffic to this. So that top of the funnel traffic then becomes um, basically a converts into a closure at the bottom, right? That's where external traffic in combination with PPC comes, right? External traffic is at the top of the funnel, but by doing the filtering, we make sure that traffic goes as, as, as down as possible on the funnel. Then PPC meets those people, a uh, other traffic in mid of the funnel within the listing, which is people already within Amazon. And then as we keep feeding this funnel over and over again, the whole end goal here is to increase your market share, right? It's increase your brand share at the keyword level, keep tracking that, and also making sure, especially if you're a product that uh, people buy on a recurring basis, you are increasing the lifetime value. This is something I see people not talking a lot, and I feel especially in 2024, is going to be more important than ever. Why? Because I feel sometimes tackles, ACOS, and all of that can be only top of the phone figures. Like sometimes you could be having, and this was a case with, with a brand I was auditing. They had a, a specific skew that they were always unprofitable. And this is a brand that had like a 15, 20 skews. So there was this specific skew that they wanted to kill because essentially the tackles, ACOS profitability was very bad. And then when I went and and basically fully dissect the funnel, that's, that 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 uh, product itself was the main leader in terms of how people were discovering the brand in the first place, right? And they took the decision to kill that specific skew because they were only focusing on tacos and echoes and the main metrics, right? And focusing what is the actual impact of this skew on the overall funnel of my brand, right? Because sometimes you could have pros that, yes, they lose your money, but on the overall picture, they actually contribute to the growth of your brand, right? So try to focus on, on the bigger picture and, and try to not get too attached into the typical echoes and tacos figures, because I feel, especially in 2024, with all the fees going up and everything, if you really don't dissect your phone in depth, you could be making the mistake of, you know, doing certain changes that will affect the overall growth of the brand. So that's everything from my side, of course, uh, more than happy to, uh, with my team, offer you a, a free audit on your account, consultation. I'm always uh, open to have a, you know, a conversation about how we can help you grow. Uh, we specialize on Amazon and Walmart. We really focus on global expansion. And as you can see, I'm a big believer 
of a you know being omnichannel. I feel being only on Amazon is becoming tougher and tougher. So I always invite people to start a, a you know opening their 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 mind to to new things like this. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I, I welcome any questions towards that. Thank you guys. Yeah. Great, perfect. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Chad, you're up next. Awesome, awesome. So, Saif, I just want to get a sense and be mindful of time here. How much time do I have? I just want to put on a timer. I've got a lot to share, but I want to We're make sure. We're supposed to finish in 36 minutes. I think we could extend it unless you guys have something scheduled at 2.30. So how, long, how, long, sorry, how long do I get? I just want to make sure I'm... Yeah, so there are three people left. I mean, if you just divide the time up, clean, it would be like 15 minutes each. So okay, 15 cool. minutes it. would be good. Awesome. Let's Let's rock and roll. So let me know if you can see my screen. Yep, good to go. Awesome. Awesome. So like I think in the Amazon space, every especially in Amazon, but in the world, right? Everyone loves a success story. The internet is filled with it, but really nobody talks about failures. So today what I want to talk about is me running my econ business, the challenges associated with it. Because actually, like Amazon in general has changed quite a bit from when I started in 2006. I was probably one of the first private label FBA sellers that were out there. But I think the goal here is like to talk about these failures, to amplify these challenges so that we can stop worshiping these success stories. Because it's really gotten a lot harder on Amazon. So I put together this, this turnaround playbook. Uh, I got a lot to share, so I'm going to really breeze through it. I mean, this is probably more of a 40-minute presentation. I'm about to consolidate into 15 minutes but it's all good. So we're going to skip about me. I've been in the space for 20 years. I sold my, I sold three other businesses. I'm working on Prophecy. Prophecy is a pricing software. Now, why is this interesting is because things on Amazon have gotten harder, right? Things aren't what they used to be and everyone's P&L is being attacked. So I want to show you how I've been able to actually take my business from red to black and make a whole lot more money uh, by a lot of these turnaround strategies. So like I mentioned, this graph right here is actually a snapshot of what's been happening. It's really the death spiral of my business. Uh, it's, a, it's a path that, that many are walking in this time, in this moment. And this story is about walking this path of bringing back this business to life. But you can look in this graph, you can see that revenue has been collapsing from its peak. And it's not just revenue, right? My profits have been collapsing as well. So... What happened? Well, inflation happened in the United States. Things got a lot harder. There's more competition than ever. There's more Chinese sellers than ever, right? And so things have just gotten a whole lot harder on Amazon as Amazon's platform has, has matured. I certainly am not the only person that's been going through it. Uh, private, not only private label brands are feeling the pain, but also aggregators as well. So I want to I wanna really go into about embracing the struggle right, about getting punched in the face and picking yourself up uh, and putting these pieces together because everyone can do it, right? It just takes time and it takes strategy. So I'm going to go through the things that I did to essentially increase my operating profit. So <laughs> this is a great quote that I love from Ben Horowitz's book. It's, if you're going to eat garbage, don't nibble. Right, And so what you want to do is you want to actually go through your business in this order. I look at it like a typewriter. You start from the left, you go to the right, and then you actually actually go back into this process again, and you start from the left to the right again. You go into each bucket, bucket and keep innovating and keep refining each bucket. So we're going to break down these buckets real quick together in the next 12 minutes. First, we're going to focus on the people. So I did a lot of things. I added core values to my business. These are personal core values that I implemented into my actual business because I believe businesses are a reflection of your core values. And these are things that I'm not willing to sacrifice in exchange for money, right? So I want to make sure that I'm hiring by these and I'm firing by these. But you, have to, you when you're creating your own core values, need to make sure that these are real values. These are truths that you hold and they're more important to you than anything else. And so the next thing I looked at was my revenue per employee efficiency metric. Am I shaking what my mama gave me? Am I being more productive than other companies? The other thing we started doing is I started actually making sure that we have the right butts in the right seats. So I built a creativity quiz that tests for critical thinking skills. Now, everything I'm sharing with you today, click on these QR codes, feel free to scan them. 
and fill out that form. And then you can actually download these things. But this is an example of a creativity quiz that we built. And this is top of funnel for candidates because I believe that the hiring process is broken. And so one of the things you can not test for in a verbal interview is your IQ level. So we test for this through pattern recognition quiz called the creativity quiz. These are auto filtered into a spreadsheet and then they're auto graded as well. And this is not chat which is also amazing. So you can really filter out the good people. There it is, there's the QR code. You can download that in this presentation. I also added a profit plan. So the profit comp plan that I've created is aligning incentives. So I wanted to make sure that if the employee is adding more value to my business, value in the form of EBITDA, if you're adding more value, you should be making more money. And so making sure that we move away from revenue embedded metrics, right? We don't focus on ACOS metrics at all. Even our PPC team doesn't focus on, on, on any ACOS metrics. We're focusing on gross profit dollars and gross profit margin, uh, the absolute profit dollars and making sure that we're selling uh, the most profitable items. And then as a percentage basis, we're making sure that we're not running out of stock. And if you don't hit these numbers, right, you get zero payout. We also implemented something called L10. L10 meetings are supposed to be the best meeting out there, the most efficient meeting. We actually run this in Notion with a template that I built. And it allows us to really build a culture that's in the open uh, and gets problems into the open so that they can be solved. OK, so that's people. Now we're going to move into, not only have we taken care of people, now we're going to move into the product. So we rationalize all of our SKUs uh, to make sure, first we figured out what was our SKU profitability. We made sure that we did a profit margin analysis across every SKU to understand and reevaluate if our SKUs were actually profitable or not and where we want to double down. So we got rid of dead stock, unloaded that, turned that back into cash, we started focusing on high margin inventory and how we defined that was one unit sold a day with at least 5% margins with a 12% 12 month stock. And then on top of that, since we didn't earn the right to invest in new products, we put all of that on hold. In other words, we want to make sure that we shake what our mama gave us. We focus on, on optimizing what we have versus expansion. And uh, this worked out really well. Now, and uh, as a subsequence of doing all these things I'm sharing in this presentation, we have now earned the right to be able to innovate. So we took that off ice, and now we're innovating and investing in new products with some really cool criteria. We also liquidated products. I have this liquidator list. Again, feel free to scan it. If you're looking to liquidate product, it's a whole list of a whole lot of people that can help you offload some inventory. All right, next was process. There's a lot here, but we focus less on ACOS. Um, a lot of sellers focus on ACOS, and to me, this is a, uh, a strategy that's suboptimal for my own business because it doesn't tell you the whole picture. It's focusing on just revenue metrics and isn't really designed to actually serve my own interests as a brand, right? It's kind of incomplete, and it leads to actually inefficient advertising spend and missed profits. And most people are focusing on the ad spend and actually aren't focusing on revenue, which is profit times units. So you need to be able to harmonize these two things together. We're going to focus on the denominator first, which is revenue, which is your price times units. Pricing specifically is the biggest lever that nobody is pulling on Amazon. And this lever drops all to the bottom line. And it's often in these areas where Amazon doesn't make more money in this case, where people don't really think about it, right? People aren't driving to this and optimizing for it. And so it's really in the fringes where there's where's this opportunity. And so what, if there's anything you're getting out of this presentation today, it's that think a whole lot more about pricing. Test your pricing and connect the dots of your pricing to other parts of your business. And it requires you to build a muscle and it takes like repeti repetition because like your pricing affects your ad spend. Your ad spend affects your inventory. Your inventory affects your, your, your finance team. And so by putting all these pieces together, actually allows you for a more holistic look at running your business to drive more profit because profit is really the only thing that matters. It's the one thing and the only thing that matters right now, especially as times are getting tough and are tough and they're going to be getting tougher. 
So we started increasing our pricing over time. Uh, we also figured out that it's not just increasing price. Some products actually need a lower price to actually increase our BSR and increase velocity. So I started really experimenting with price because a lot of people on Amazon don't change price. Why? Out of fear. Uh, they don't think about it. It's just static pricing. It's something we actually don't believe in as a company. The same way Uber has dynamic pricing, different times of the day based on different signals, we do the same thing. And I built a spreadsheet initially to help transition and work on what is the optimal decision? What's the objective we're trying to accomplish with every single field that we would need to figure out if we're making the right optimal decision around pricing and managing that on a, on a, uh, on a daily basis? And it actually becomes quite um, significant. And there's the spreadsheet right there in the QR code. Feel free to, to scan it. You get that for free for listening in and tuning in. Now, if you look at the actual impact right, of our ASPs, our average selling prices, and look at the impact on our net margins, right, there is a correlation of what happened. And you can see here that now, at least in this since August 23, we hit roughly around 12% operating margins. And now I'm actually pushing upwards of almost 18%. Uh, operating margins. I'm, I'm curious to hear, uh, I, I think Rashad is talking about margins in the next presentation, but I'm curious to hear what he thinks about my op margins. But again, I went from negative margins, losing $50,000 a month, to now actually producing a quite a positive impact in my business. Now, we focus on the revenue, which is price times units. Again, you can do this, by the way, you can do this manually, or you can use Prophecy to do this, and I'm happy to support you in your journey. Uh, we do this automatically using AI because it actually becomes quite daunting to pull every signal every signal into a model to figure out what's the optimal decision. We're doing this automatically and we're doing this intraday for you. Uh, and our brands are seeing a roughly a 10 to 15% lift in gross profit, which is actually what we see here, a uh, significant lift in profitability. Now, the second piece is your ad spend. So just ad spend, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about this with Saif because Saif spoke about it, but we've transitioned internally from... Uh, a cost metrics and return on ad, ad spend to profit on ad spend. So we really wanted to isolate our contribution profit dollars in the business so that it includes all of our costs and all of our landed costs. Now you can use your profit on ad spend or you can use what, what I call TPO as, which is your total profit on ad spend to have more clarity in the business. And so when you're looking at your profit versus a revenue embedded metric like a cost, you are looking at all the costs to deliver the product, right? It's very precise and will help you guide. It doesn't mean you have to be profitable on all your ad spend, but it helps you guide decision-making abilities when you're actually looking to, uh, to deploy ad dollars appropriately. For me, in my own business, my objective was to maximize every dollar of opportunity for profitability. And so a higher POAS means more profit per acquired business. And if you want me to do a POAS analysis, I'm happy to do it. You can scan that QR code, happy to help. I know a lot of people st sometimes struggle with this because like transitioning from revenue embedded metrics, ACOS, TACOS, ROAS is difficult. So I'm happy to support you in the journey. You can scan that or you can even email me at chat at prophecy.com. All right. So uh, I got two minutes left, but really it's about just becoming smarter about how you're deploying your dollars to outsmart your competitors. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about, and this is something that I probably would love to talk about safe offline, is about harmonizing your price and your ad spend together. So you can see in this example, price increases 20%. Now we increase price over time, and you can actually increase your A cost 20%, and you can double your contribution profit dollars. So when you harmonize price and ad spend, so we work with a lot of agencies and a lot of ad softwares to harmonize price and ad spend together, so that you could unlock profit. Now, price dictates ad spend. So we drive price decisions and then share those decisions with the advertising platforms so that they can help make better decisions for their businesses to drive more profit dollars. Uh, so we really wanna harmonize those two things together, including inventory, by the way, which is something that we do. In the last minute, we also decided to circumvent and cut out all these external factors most importantly, a 3PL. So we cut out our 3PL in the United States. We now go direct from China, direct to Amazon's distribution center. We currently do not use AWD. It's something that I'm like actually looking into, but currently we use a 3PL that aggregates everything in China 
and then consolidates it from all of our factories because we have at least 30 factories. And then we inject them directly into the distribution center. So I got a whole lot smarter. That's actually what's driven a lot of our net margin from roughly about 13% to now 20%. I'm happy to make a warm introduction. If you scan that QR code, if it helps make you more money, I'm happy to help support it. So the last thing of taking all these steps with 30 seconds left is you take, you look at people, you look at product, you look at process, and now you drive more profits. And so you can see what's happened in the transition from our net profit, looking at our average selling price and our net margin to what actually happened in the business in 2023. We're operating at a profit margin right now. We're roughly about 15 or 16% as we've now removed our 3PL. I see that going up to 20%. You can see this in a graph. What a beautiful looking graph. I'm super, super uh, happy that I was able to do this, but it does take hard decisions to make this happen. And if you want to learn more, there goes my timer. Uh, if you want to learn more about pricing, prophecy, uh, you can for sure click that QR code right there. We're offering a 50% discount for an entire year. This is not to current customers, to, but to future customers. If you're private label, you want to make more money, at least 10 to 15%, feel free to hit me up, scan that QR, QR code. If you want to just talk shop with me, chat at prophecy.com, scan that QR code. You can find me on Twitter posting a lot of opinions and thoughts and also on LinkedIn. That's all I got. Perfect. No, this was awesome. I like have a couple of questions. I'll leave them until the Q and A, but this was really interesting. Is this for uh thing crucial? This is for think crucial. Yeah. My e-commerce brand that's it's 20 years old. So yeah, we uh, met a couple of years ago, not you and I, I think it was me and Chris. Kristen. Yeah. Kristen. Yeah, no, yeah, this she is was, interesting yep. seeing the... Uh, so with, with peace and love, she's no longer with the company and uh, we've definitely yeah. transitioned our team into a different model, for sure. Right, that makes sense. But no, this is awesome. I have a couple of questions for you. I'll leave it until the Q&A. Perfect. Kagan, you're up next. I think there is no sound, yeah? Just to confirm that. Yeah, I think you're on mute. We're good to go, though. We're good right now. Are all good? Yeah, now good. Okay. okay. Do you see my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that I have two screen here. Which screen you are seeing with the URL or just the presentation? Uh, I see the slides. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, like today, I'm gonna you know give you some numbers uh, that we get from um, like our you know partners. Uh, we are working with a lot of agencies. We are working with a lot of Amazon sellers. And the first thing that I want to mention is revenue illusion. Uh, <clears throat> like when I talk with the sellers, especially you know <clears throat> I'm coming from selling background. Um, like we really like revenue numbers go up. And this is the most dangerous thing uh, in this environment because the last time that I look at Amazon has, you know, 90 different fees that they are charging us and they will start charging us the return processing fee starting from June 1st. Uh, they already implemented, you know, low level inventory fees. Uh, we have, you know, long-term inventory fees, short-term inventory fees, inbound, uh, you know, transportation fees. Now people are facing inbound, inbound placement fees. And if you're just looking at the revenue, um, you get a, you know, uh, a really tough position. And the <clears throat> uh, number one thing that I you know, tell the sellers, you got to know your numbers. And uh, with the profit cyclops, what we are trying to do is, you know, uh, we have the profit numbers at the transaction level, and we do have the profit numbers at the, uh, skill level, and we also have the profitability at the account level. I just want to make sure that, guys, if you can uh, let me know, you're now seeing the know your numbers uh, slide, right? We can I see, just want to make sure. yeah, we can see the one that say 
Uh, yeah, no, your numbers, we can see now. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Yeah, then you're that screen. Sorry about that. And as I mentioned, we are looking at the order level, if the order is profitable uh, after, you know, cost of goods and the, you know, advertising and the storage fee, we have, you know, analysis about the skill level profitability and we have account level profitability. Uh, account level profitability includes if you're selling on Walmart, what's your profitability on your Walmart? Um, if you're selling on Shopify, what's your profitability? If you're selling in UK, what's your profitability in UK? And if you're selling in US, what's your profitability in US? And as I mentioned, these are some of the numbers um, that we collect with our partners and we anonymize the data. Uh, they have their consent. And I want to you know, divide the profitability in two because we do have resellers and we do have private labels. Uh, and when we look at the resellers, uh, sometimes we call it wholesale wholesalers, <clears throat> the cost of goods sold is 44%. And if you look at the FBA fulfillment fees and the referral fees, it's around 40% as well. And the average profit margin is around 13%. Uh, like 1.1% is sometimes, you know, people are running advertising for uh, brands that they have exclusivity. Uh, like the return rates are, you know, lower uh, with the you know, reseller uh, business model. And as you can see, like 80% is FBA fulfillment fees, referral fees, and the cost of goods. And I have seen sellers with, you know, 19, 20% profit margin, as well as, you know, eight, 9% profit margin as well. 20% uh, profit margins are the businesses with the, you know, close relationship with their manufacturers. Maybe they have some kind of exclusivity. And when we come to the private label, again, uh, as you can see, the profit margins are higher. Uh, when we first run this, you know, analysis, I was a little surprised because I was expecting a lower number. Uh, because the, you know, uh, we are working with uh, closer with some of the brands and their profit margins uh, were tend to be lower. Uh, but as you can see, like the FBA fulfillment fees are 18% compared to, you know, 27% uh, uh, with the, you know, reseller. And the cost of consoles is 15%. Like when I first, you know, start selling in 2016, I remember my mentor telling me, like, if you're purchasing an item for $3, uh, from China, uh, you're going to sell it for $12 on Amazon in order to be profitable. And it was 25% and it was working back then, but it's not working anymore because uh, you see, you got to spend 13% of your, uh, you know, revenue for advertising and um, private labels, uh, you are keeping, you know, inventory a little more and the returns and the, you know, inventory fees that you are paying tend to higher, as you can see, 6%. And, uh, you know, uh, like the referral fee is pretty much the same. There's nothing you can do. Uh, but most of the successful sellers I have seen, uh, they are tend to sell, you know, items that are not heavy and not cheap. And how can I improve my profit margin um, in store by store? We have a, you know, profit margin analysis for each SKU. Uh, you can, you know, uh, filter this out by parent ASIN. It shows all the fees, you know, promos, returns, referral, fulfillment, shipping, advertising, storage, and gives you a profit margin. And last week, uh, a seller around 10 million, you know, um, annual revenue. Uh, she told me that they cut half of the, half of the SKUs that are not, you know, generating profit for them. And actually, that's what you should do. Um, like most of the sellers that I see, they have emotional attachment uh, for the SKUs that they have, you know, come up with. And like the numbers never, you know, tell a lie. And if it is not working, it's not working. And you got to get rid of the SKUs that are not working for you. And what I see most of the successful sellers are just cutting off, you know, 20, 30% of the ASINs that are not working for them for the last 12 months. And then move forward with the items that are working uh, for them profitably. And um, there are some metrics that I do uh, you know, follow when I make analysis because we are working with, you know, buyers who are purchasing Amazon businesses, uh, as well as, you know, we are working with lenders, uh, we are working with agencies. Um, like uh, if your ad reliance is around 60%, when I say ad reliance, if you're, you know, selling three items and 12 of them is from, you know, organic, 
Uh, one of them is from inorganic. You're in a good position. Uh, like if your ad reliance is around, you know, like 70%, 80%, like if your 80% of sales are coming from organic channels, um, there's no way you are, you know, not profitable. Probably you're above 20%. And the tacos is another metric that I look at it is 5%. Uh, like this should be the aim. Uh, but I have seen, you know, stores that manage to sell around, you know, 3%, 4% tacos as well as 10%. Uh, but uh, again, it really depends on the FBA fees that you are paying. If you are, you know, selling heavy items that are cheap, it's not going to work anymore. Uh, like uh, last week, I think we made an analysis for one of our, you know, uh, partner companies and uh, like their, you know, FBA fees uh, over sales were around 30%. And we suggested them to get rid of the heavy and cheap items. And again, a couple of days ago, I made an analysis for my uh, close friends store and the cost of goods over sales were, uh, you know, 20, 29%, I assume. And his profitability was um, 10%. Uh, doing private label and after the analysis that we make you know like uh, if he aims to you know 18 percent cox uh over sales uh, his profitability is going to become around 19 to 20 percent and uh, like he was um, supplying all the products from uh, you know europe and he is now thinking to switch to china in order to you know decrease the cost of goods over sales there is one underrated metric, uh, like the return rates. Um, like I have, you know, seen maybe thousand or two thousand stores, you know, return rates from profit cyclops. Uh, we are doing, you know, analysis for them. Uh, it is, it never changes. You know, if you are selling an item high, uh, if it is your top seller, it should be your least return needs item. Like um, Amazon decreases your visibility if your item is returning a lot. And with this report, once you click it, it's not, you know, uh, that I can show right now. Uh, but if you click it, you see the reason uh, why people are returning these items. And um, again, analysis show that if you decrease your return rates 10 to 20 percent, it can go, you know, your revenue can go up 10 to 20 percent as well. Because uh, Amazon simply doesn't want to deal with the returns. And if your return rate is higher than your competition, uh, they simply increase your competition visibility and uh, they you know don't want to deal with the returns um and uh as you know safe mentioned uh like 80 percent of your profitability and revenue comes from your uh, you know 20 percent of uh your products uh and you gotta at least have multiple hero products which are you know 10 percent a cost five percent tacos uh the ranking is 4.4 return rates between zero and 1% and profit margin is 25%. And if, if you have this type of products and if you are not selling at the thousands margin, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 10,000, uh, you are losing a lot of money, uh, leaving a lot of money on the table. And uh, with some analytics, we can show you the products uh, that can be hero product uh, within your store. And uh, the other strategy that I'm always telling to sellers, look for new marketplaces, look for new items and look for new verticals. Uh, the sellers that we are working right now, uh, seeing the most of the jump from, you know, TikTok shop, um, like most of the sellers from US. Uh, I remember, um, uh, <clears throat> I remember the UK is also, you know, um, supporting TikTok shop right now. I'm not sure if you're able to sell there, uh, but again, uh, it's a good opportunity for Amazon sellers. And the trend is, uh, you know, when you open up your TikTok shop and start, you know, working with influencers, uh, some of the sellers that are, you know, eight figure, uh, just recently became, you know, eight figure sellers from seven to eight. Uh, people are looking at their product on TikTok, uh, but they are coming to the Amazon and, you know, purchasing their products. And uh, this is without advertising. And this really helps to increase their profit margin as well. And it's always an optimization game. As I mentioned, get rid of your bottom 20%. Uh, some sellers are, you know, changing their design of box in order to, you know, um, pay less uh, FPA fees and advertise wisely. And I'm going to give you another hard number if your Walmart sales in the U.S. is less than 15% of your Amazon sales, uh, you're below average.
Uh, and one thing that I always suggest to the sellers from US, uh, I have seen this with a lot of brands try to sell in EU and UK. Uh, since the countries are small, the shipping prices, FBA fees are small. Uh, Amazon is not charging inventory fee three times at the end of the year. They just increase it 50%. Uh, like the CPAs and CPCs are better. Uh, and uh, like what I see with the sellers that are selling in the US or Canada, if they start selling in the EU and UK, sometimes they double their revenue. Sometimes they increase, you know, 50%, 60%, but the profit margins are better. And feel free to shoot me an email. This is my email address. I will be happy to do, you know, this analysis for you. Um, and then, you know, we can look up the items that are eating your profits. We can look up the fees that are eating your profits. If you're generating 100K per month, uh, in a half an hour, I can at least save, you know, five grand. And I can show you the items that you can pretty scale. That's all for me today. Thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Super interesting numbers there. Thank you for sharing. We have one speaker left. I think it's Rashad. So uh, yeah, it's it's your turn. Thank you, Saif. Uh, brilliant presentations. Thank you, panelists. Um, uh, working uh, backwards up the list, uh, uh, Kagan, uh, you're spot on. Uh, absolutely spot on with uh, the metrics and uh, being in the profitability space as well. We, we see the similar sort of things. Uh, but all of this is very daunting, you know, uh, putting all of these numbers into one place and then trying to see how it will impact uh, our sales and our revenues and, of course, the bottom line profitability. But Kagan, let's uh, let's take out all of our underrated metrics, our, our refund metrics and put it into one place. Uh, Chad, love your spreadsheets, mate. Um, we definitely, definitely need to catch up over a coffee. Let's take all of your metrics and put that into one place as well. Uh, Vincenzo, we, we go way back. Um, absolutely. Google, YouTube, these are all underrated driving and profitability driving metrics for sellers. Um, we're integrated with Google and uh, we see the spike in the YouTube traffic directly to listings. And safe, yes, you're bang on. Uh, let's uh, let's bring in all of the listing changes into one place. But that's a, that's a real challenge for sellers. Um, how do we how do we as agency owners or service providers expect our sellers to be able to handle all of this? And that was the that was the same challenge I had when I was a seller uh, going through the four or five figure range up to the seven, eight figure range. I think products and profitability come second. I think we need to get a house in order first, getting uh, like a, a few people, a few of the panelists have said, trimming the fat right off, you know, um, in London. Three weeks ago, one of the largest Amazon sellers in the country had to shut down. And it had nothing to do with their profitability. It had everything to do with the fact that they were overpaying on rents and rates. And the building expenses were too much. And the staff of costing was too much. Now, because they hadn't taken that into consideration, the business has effectively shut down. I'm just going to uh, jump in and share my screen. Uh, please let me know when you can see our, um, uh, our dashboard. Um, Cool. It should be coming up any second now. I can see it loading again. Give it a moment. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Can everybody else see it? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Um, I firmly believe that we are way out of the range where we can just depend on Amazon. We love Amazon, but we can't just solely rely on Amazon anymore. Multi-channel is the only way forward. Um, and I'm sure Vincenzo would agree that uh, a lot of the sellers are seeing now hyper growth uh, across off Amazon as opposed to on Amazon. There's only so much meat on the bone that you could take from Amazon, but Amazon is, is still by far one of the most important players. Now, uh, you can't put all of your eggs in your basket and nor could I when I was a seller. So this is what sales. What sales is our multi-channel profitability and performance dashboard. Uh, in this particular demo account right now, we've got Amazon Vendor, eBay, Amazon, B&Q. In the UK, we're seeing a, a large spike in B&Q, Dunelm range. So what we've done is we've taken all of the majority of the major platforms and put them into what sales. So you don't have to. Cutting down on spreadsheets, cutting down on all of this profit tracking. Uh, we aggregate all of our data into one place. Uh, we can channel our uh, uh, efforts into focusing on the performance of the product as opposed to trying to figure out all of the nitty gritty stuff. 
Let's see our channel revenue performance. Let's see how our across the board ACOS and TACOS is. Let's see across the board which fulfillment service is driving the most profitability. Is it FBA or is it FBM? Uh, let's see how our ads are performing, not just on Amazon, but eBay, on YouTube, on social media. Let's see how that is overall driving our take us down for our entire business. Um, Kagan, something you picked up on, uh, underrated metric, 100% agree with you, buddy. Refunds. Refunds are costing businesses millions, if not billions, every year. And if you don't get a handle on it very quickly, things are going to spiral out of shape really fast. Uh, promo codes. Um, uh, I noticed that not many people spoke about the promo codes today, but if you're heavily dependent on running a promotion every time you have to sell a product, then either the product's wrong or your strategy's wrong. Uh, pricing has a large part to play on it. Um, I, I completely agree with Chad. It's uh, making sure that your pricing strategy is right. But once again, it's very daunting. Um, when I was working uh, with uh, the wholesalers uh, back in the day, uh, it was something that I picked up that Pricing strategy doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the cheapest. It can also be that you're driving the most value at the right price. And if you can position that with your ads, you got a, you got a winner. Our trend widgets here, um, everybody hates um, calculating profits uh, and uh, trying to figure out which is my best seller on what platform. So let's uh, let, let what sales do all of the maths for you. And we can quickly pull out which is our least seller um, one of the panelists was saying that let's trim the bottom 20% off. This is how you trim 20% off in 30 seconds. Let's figure out which products are performing and which ones are not. Let's focus on the ones which are really performing. Profit and loss statements. Um, I, I I believe that if a business isn't top, isn't on top of its property, uh, profitability and uh, loss statements, uh, then the business is going to be in trouble, especially uh, with features like month over month tracking. Uh, set up alerts, you know, be a smart seller, use your time wisely, uh, figure out where you're bleeding. And if there are unexpected increases or decreases in expenses, then be alerted about it straight away. So this is a, a really smart feature that we have uh, within uh, uh, what sales. Moving on from there with orders, um, what uh, what I was doing as a, as, as a best practice when, when I was selling was dissecting a reorder. Um, uh, on uh, profitability software, the, the best way to do that is once you uh, have an order shipped, then you can start seeing a, a lot of uh, uh, analysis. How much are you actually spending per order? Uh, is that changing? Is that varying uh, over time? Is that varying over the month? Are you spending more on pick, pack and send? Are you spending more on state market taxes? Is there is there an increase in clawback fees? And there, there's so many things to watch out for. But similarly, um, what of my products are constituting towards what part of my revenue? That's where your 80-20 rule comes in. Now, we can spend hours and hours in building really fancy spreadsheets to do this, or we can just click a couple of buttons. And let's pull out those 20 ASINs or those 20% which are driving our 80% of revenue. Uh, just uh, quickly moving on, we can do that on the flip side as well. Refunds. Which of my products are causing me most damage? Which of my products are driving my negative revenue? My negative revenue being those products which I'm selling 10,000 of every single month, but you know what, 3,000 are coming back and it's building, it's pulling my whole account down. So let, let's let's drill into that uh, and let's remove those products. Um, something that I wanna to touch on very quickly, uh, I, I believe it was uh, Safe um, and uh, Vincenzo earlier, that, um, I, and I won't go too much into the numbers of this, but. I do believe as uh, something that I said earlier that as agency owners and as service providers, we do have a moral obligation uh, to our sellers to really deliver them the best of service. Now, every seller has one, two, three VAs sitting at, in some place in the world doing designs or whatever, or, the, or you appoint an agency to revamp my whole catalog images or redo my hero images or, or make my A+. Plus. We've got a really smart feature in here. Now, I just want to take this particular dummy product. This is one of our demo accounts. Now, this is a, a demo product of ours. Now, one thing I used to really hate when, um, uh, and, I, and I use that word lightly, uh, but when I, when I was working with different freelancers and different staff, oh, what are you doing? We're working on optimizing the product. 
What are you doing? We're working on keyword changes. Uh, what are you doing this week? We're, we're changing the hero images. And I could never keep track of this. I could never keep track that if I've changed the keywords, has that made a positive or a negative impact? If I've changed an ad campaign, I couldn't quite grasp how it's positively or negatively impacted my product or my ASIN. Um, if there was image changes, I couldn't quite put my finger on by changing these images, did it really make the impact on the listing or was it the increased ad spend? So you know what, let's uh, eliminate that. Why don't we put in exactly when the images were changed, what impact it had on the BSR, what impact it had on the sales. Now, on this particular example, we know that when images were changed, there was a dip in the algo, that's fine. But after that, on the 15th of April, these images were changed. From the 19th of April onwards, we've seen an incline up. Now, there's only one thing left using the power of deduction, because let's face it, if, if one thing's not working, the other thing is. It's the refunds which are pulling this down. So me changing the images didn't really fix a problem. I've just added extra expense to my bottom line. It wasn't the images that needed changing, though it's now fantastic that I can see all of that, but it was the refunds of the products. Am I listening to my audience? Now, once again, we can spend hours and hours and hours um, auditing accounts. And uh, and this is why we work so closely with agencies because we, we reduce 80 to 100 hours worth of admin work every single week. Uh, we've just started working with another um, agency based in India. They've got 2,000 uh, Amazon sellers and we're already saving them approximately a thousand hours worth of admin time a month. This is the sentiment. 47% of the audience of this particular product loves the product. 14% uh, is on the fence. 39% of the uh, audience hates the products. Let's figure out why. And now you can drill down all of that. And we've also added a really cool feature where you can actually pick up all of this feedback and send it automatically to the supplier that, hey, you know, you owe me a, a credit note. You owe me some replacement units because I've had this many refunds and this many uh, negative reviews coming from your product. So it's things like these where, yes, we need to assist the sellers to streamline their selling experience. I think uh, um, uh, one thing that we never talk about as service providers is the amount of time that's invested in this. There is obviously the pre-sales element where you do your keyword research and your product research. Fine, that, that has its own place. Then you've got your post-sales, which is the worrying factor. I'm worried about my bottom line. I'm worried about my profit. I'm worried about if I'm actually going to make the rent this month. Let's talk about that. Let's figure out where you're bleeding and let's put a stop to it. Uh, some other quick features that I'd like to quickly just uh, go on is product intelligence. Um, especially with wholesalers, uh, we recently signed up, um, uh, where we've become Walmart partners now and TikTok partners we made, we became a couple of months ago. Uh, we've become Walmart partners and, uh, in the U S especially we've picked up, um, a fair few, uh, Walmart sellers. Now, wholesalers who have 500 SKUs, a thousand SKUs, it's going to take them a couple of weeks just to sift through their uh, catalog. So we've designed an AI. Now, the AI is quite smart. It's smarter than humans. It will go back and tell you seven days worth it versus your month versus your quarter versus your last year. So your week on week, your month on month, your quarter on quarter, and your year on year, which products are performing, underperforming, and how much is it costing you? Because those are the ones which you either need to desperately go and fix or you need to get rid of. But on the flip side, We've also created a, a sensible AI, which looks for opportunities as well, which is why I tell all of my sellers, uh, all of our customers that this particular one page is going to do two things for you, guaranteed. It's going to either make you money or it's going to save you money. Now, these are the products which week on week, month on month, year on year are increasing. Now, if you can get the ad campaigns right on this, if you can get the right exposure on this, then you're onto a winner. Uh, just uh, uh, moving towards a close, I'm just going to quickly come on to the advertising um, and uh, Vincenzo loves uh, his, his advertising side. Um, uh, 
just relying on Amazon PPC to drive you traffic is a thing of the past. You, you need to be a dinosaur to be believing that now. Uh, if you're not doing off Amazon advertising, if you're not doing off Walmart advertising, if you're not multi-channel to begin with, you're not going to last very long. At, uh, you know, scaling up from uh, seven figures upwards just on Amazon, it's a pipe dream now. You, know, you, you, need, to, you need to have multi-channels in place. Um, but let's automate some of that. Let's, uh, let's uh, make heads and tails of that. Let the AIs do the job. Let, let the AIs do the, the heavy lifting. If it's ACOS you're after, which I agree with the panelists, it's, it's not the metric that we should be focused on. It should be the take Um, But then let's monitor that. Let's create an AI which will automatically go through all of your advertising campaigns and let the AI tell you in a traffic-like format whether it's an opportunity to scale, it needs a review, or pull your finger out because it's critical and needs to be fixed. That, uh, gents, is uh, is what sales. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, pulled together uh, uh, all of our um, knowledge as as sellers, and we've we've all been through this. Uh, a commendable, Chad, you've you've exited a, a much higher rate. Um, everything that we've learned um, for me as a seller, I was annoyed at the fact that I need to be so people dependent, and I wanted to take the guesswork out of dependency. Uh, so let's throw it all in. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, hopefully with a few minutes to spare, um, try it out. WhatSales.io. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. We're the, um, uh, we're the fastest growing uh, profitability and performance platform. Uh, we're exclusive partners with Linworks as well. Uh, we're onboarding Linworks customers from all over the world. Uh, we've just become Walmart and TikTok partners. We're Google and social media partners as well. There's lots of exciting things happening. Um, but yeah, that's us. Safe over to you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for sharing the demo with us. And it looks like you have a very interesting platform. Right now, we have some time for a Q&A. So there is a Q&A box. It's a chat box. It should be in the middle of your screen if you're a participant. And you can send any questions you have over. So I'm just going to ask these questions out loud. And then whoever the questions directed towards can give us an answer. Right, we just had one come in for um, Ecomc, which I believe is Vincenzo. Uh, it says, what are some often overlooked elements within Amazon product listings that can significantly boost conversion rates and how can sellers implement A-B testing effectively to optimize these elements? Yeah, so I think when it comes to A-B testing, one of the things that... Um, is hugely a, a big mistake is that when people come up with options to do the A-B testing, they do it from the perception of how they think they know the product and it's not based on an audience right? A analysis, which is why I was so heavy on that during my presentation. So I recommend before doing any A-B testing at all, first of all, define the avatar, understand your avatar. You'll be surprised how many brands they think that they know the avatar, but they don't. Uh, there are many tools out there. I mean, with ChatGPT, you can define an avatar. We're talking one, two hours, you can have a very detailed avatar about the, you know, the type of person that can potentially buy your product. Then once you define the avatar, that's the starting point to do audio testing, right? Then you, there are tools out there such as Pigfu, uh, Intellivi, a Pro Opinion, some of the main partners I use to do this. So basically use them in terms of using the avatar, which is, you know, the range, um, that comes from your analysis. And once you come up with those elements, those are the ones I test. What are some of the ones that drive the best uh, improvement in conversion? For me, it's usually the main image and pricing. Those are the ones that usually move the needle the most. Uh, going back to pricing, and I know that's something that Chad is very uh, close to, I strongly believe that you need to split this that all the time. Like if you don't, uh, and, uh, and that happens a lot of times, sometimes we're having this conversation about you should increase the price and people is afraid and then they increase the price and actually sales improve, right? Uh, you need to do these things because if you don't, like so many times you leave so much money on the table. So yeah, images and pricing, I would say are the ones that uh, for sure drive the most improvement on my A-B testing, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Chad, I actually have a question for you. Um, what do you guys do about the price mapping? Because I know Amazon obviously cross checks your price on the different platforms you're listed on. So what if you have like a Shopify and a Walmart running in parallel to your Amazon store, and you're like increasing prices on Amazon? Does that not affect buy box for you guys? No, there's there's definitely there's an onboard process. So for example, if you're on Shopify, 
and you want to have price parity, we can essentially give you a spreadsheet where you can go and upload that onto Shopify. If you want to make sure that your pricing is always above on Amazon or below, right, you can set prices or match prices on the form. So typically, the ideal client profile of someone that's on Prophecy is someone that's private label. They don't sell into Vendor Central, right? They have complete control over their price. And Amazon's a significant needle mover for their business. Like typically 80% or 90% of revenue is actually driven by Amazon. That's currently where, where we play. Sure. That makes sense. That makes sense. I have another question coming in for Profit Cyclops. Is being profitable on Amazon harder now? <laughs> yeah, no, of course it's harder because, you know, uh, for the return uh, orders, you know, you were just paying 20% of uh, the uh, referral fee actually. And starting from June 1st, uh, they're going to charge you for each order uh, if your, you know, return rate is higher than the, you know, vertical average, uh, which Amazon published recently. And, you know, low level inventory fee, uh, you know, new placement fees, they're all, uh, you know, advertising, eating profits. But uh, still, uh, the numbers show that sellers are somehow, you know, managing these challenges. They're increasing their profitability. Uh, it's kind of an optimization game still. Uh, a successful seller is a successful seller. And they manage to, you know, find a way in order to increase their profitability, in order to increase their margins. Uh, like there are some sellers, you know, last year their profit margins was around 40%. Uh, like a couple, you know, weeks ago, we made another another analysis together. Like it just jumped to 50% despite all the fees. Uh, yeah, it's it's harder and you're going to know your number. And uh, keep in mind that Amazon is not going to, uh, like this is my instinct, doesn't want to deal with small sellers. You know, like you got to know your name. You gotta know your game, and you know you gotta scale and be the ones uh, who are gonna be you know successing, and uh, you will face with less competition. And there are threats, but there are a lot of opportunities as well. Awesome, sounds good. So we had a question come in for myself, and it says, "When do I know to launch new products? How many new products launch, and when it's going to be the main factor that drives growth?" So for the product launches, it just depends on your current situation. So if you're in a similar situation to the one Chad was in a few years ago with Think Crucial, and you're already losing money every month and your current like product catalog isn't doing that well, then you're not in a position to invest in like 10 new launches per quarter, right? Probably what would make sense at that point is to check if anything in your portfolio or catalog is doing well, then try to salvage that and cut out the rest similar to what Chad did. But if you're pretty profitable, you have, you know, good cash flow, you have good cash on hand and your sales aren't increasing as fast as they should be and your ASINs are kind of stagnant. And at that point, you want to be launching more and more aggressively. So it just depends how good the current growth is, how much money you have, how much profit you're making, or on the flip side, like how much money you're losing. Because if you're underwater, it's not the right time to invest more money into, you know, sourcing new products, testing new products, running new product launches for a few months, spending on ads for these new products, especially since they're going to be at a loss at least for the first three or four months. So it's going to add on to the negative um, margin that you already have. So it just depends on your situation. If you're on a healthy business and it's not going as fast as you'd like, launch a lot. If you're on a healthy business and it's going as fast as you'd like, still keep launching because it's going to maintain your business and help you to go even faster. If you're on an unhealthy business, then probably focus on cutting down the expenses, eliminating duds from your catalog. And then after that, once you get back into profitability, you can focus on launching. Finally, we have a question for uh, what sales? It says, what impacts BSR in Amazon and how important is it? There is no one answer. And it's a great question. It's a, it's a great question. Um, if your listing isn't optimized right, it's not going to appear in any results. Your BSR is going to fall. If your uh, listing is optimized correctly and you've got excessive refunds, you're going to fall. If you're optimized correctly and you're not getting refunds and your pricing is off the charts, you're going to fall. So it's not just one thing, you know, and this is why 
the power of deduction really comes into play. Get all of the data on the chart and let's see what's impacting positively and negatively. Hope that answers that. Great, perfect. Perfect, so that's it for this webinar. Uh, I'm thinking we just recap our offers very quick for anyone who uh, didn't keep track. So I'm gonna start first and we can just go in order of who presented. So for AI Hello, I was offering a month of free managed service, which includes any catalog work you need, which is like adding products, adding variations, solving seller support issues, uh, free listing content, free PPC work, and free software. And uh, that's, you know, not, you're not obliged to enroll into paid after that. So that was my offer. And the only condition is you'd have to be spending more than 10 grand a month and operate in the US, Canada, or Europe. Right, Vincenzo? Yeah, from my side, I think uh, going back to the omni-channel is something I try to provide a ton of value when we do a uh, free uh, audits. It's to really figure out how we can take your brand beyond Amazon, right? So we're investing a lot of resources to things such as Walmart, TikTok shop. Uh, so more than happy to jump on a call with you guys, figure out how we can use things outside of Amazon to also grow your Amazon brand. And just to uh, drop the extra sense here, like we actually also started working very heavy on DSP and AMC. The reason why I'm investing very heavy in AMC is I'm a big believer as people become omnichannel, you need a brain to process all that data and figure out what is happening on Amazon. So if, if you wanna figure out if that's actually the right time to pull the the the, the trigger on that, I'm happy to yeah jump on a call and see how we can make it happen. Yeah. Perfect, Chad. Yeah, so those that wanna make more profits, at least 10 to 15% more, sometimes it's exceeding that hit me up, uh, chad at prophecy.com. That's P-R-O-F-A-S-E-E.com. We're offering 50% off for one year to use our software only for new customers. That's chad at prophecy.com. You want to make more money and maximize your potential. Perfect. Kagan? Uh, yeah, we can do, you know, uh, personal onboarding. Um, I normally like to do, you know, onboarding sessions with the clients, uh, 30 minutes free you know, onboarding session and analysis. And if you, you know, subscribe using um, AI Hello uh, coupon, we can give you two months free. Perfect. And finally, Rashad. Um, Safe, we don't really have a special offer, but if you want to know where your business is going, go to whatsales.io, sign up. There's a 14 days free trial. And after that, we'll definitely sit down and talk. All right, awesome. All right. Thank you for everyone who listened into the webinar. Uh, I hope you guys found it useful and thank you guys for presenting. You all did an awesome job. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I'll catch you again on my next webinar. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Pleasure. Bye-bye.